Hi everyone, Bernard here. I hope you're all staying safe and well and welcome to the Citizen channel and another episode of the City Book Club. Yeah, City Book Club. So we've done a few of these now. Hope you're enjoying them and uh, join me for this one. Uh, yeah, we're going to look at um, one of our legends. Uh, this obviously, this shirt I'm wearing now has significance. I'm not going to touch upon that today, but... Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about uh, this gentleman in this fantastic book. Um, say it, it's more about his uh, his actually war effort and stuff like that as well. This book, it's not just about city and football, etc. It's it's more about the build up to it. Of course, Troutman's journey from Hitler Youth to FA Cup legend. It sort of finishes around the FA Cup, of course. But uh, yeah, there's going to we're going to dip into in and out of this over the next uh, few weeks, months, years. Hopefully, who knows and. Uh, Hopefully enjoy it and take some a couple of excerpts out of it as well. So please join me as we have a look at that from Katrina Clay. Yeah, Katrina Clay did that. I'm not. Uh, I'll find out a little bit more about that uh, Katrina Clay. I'm not. Don't know too much. Uh, too much about them to be honest with you. I'm going to look at uh, a chapter that simply in call. It's actually the last one in the book uh, before the uh, epi. Is it the epilogue? They call it right at the end. I think they call it the epilogue. Let's just check. Yeah, before the epilogue, it's uh, and it's just simply called Cup Final, which but, uh, it could be called Cup Finals, really, but uh, we'll have more on that in a minute. Anyway, please, if you're new to this channel, push that subscribe button. Tell your city supportive friends about this. We do lots of different things, obviously, on city past and present. Lots of different features. You'll also see some stuff on my film and TV channel. If you enjoy what I do, please push that notification button so you get to know when these come out. At least one, at least one vlog normally a day, so for uh, film and TV and one blog for Manchester City so there you go try and keep keep you keep myself busy and keep you keep you informed and entertained there's going to be some links on the screen for Facebook and Twitter as well so if you follow a friend me on there do check every couple of days and follow and friend everyone back and I have a little website as well a little day job uh, where I sell old and rare DVDs and movie posters that's on that moviegamenostalgia.com so if you ever get a chance to have a look at that it'd be much appreciated Comments always appreciated about this, about Bertrand, and whatever you want to co comment about about Manchester City, always welcome. I try and answer all the comments, obviously. And please, if you've no time to comment today, just give us a little thumbs up. That'd be absolutely brilliant. Yeah, so the chapter we're looking at is called Cup Final. Let's say it's the last chapter in the book, and we look at what we're going to do with this within this little excerpt is look at uh, a little bit about the Revy plan and the 1955 FA Cup final, which wasn't as uh, significant uh, or rewarding for City. Obviously, it was uh, a 3 1 loss to Newcastle United, that you, you probably know that. And so, yeah, so let's have a look at this. So, yeah, the background to the Revy plan it was the of course, the magnificent Magyars, wasn't it? They were called the Hungarians, uh, the international team. They were almost unbeatable. I think they were unbeatable for a while in the early 1950s. And the city manager at the town, Le time, Les McDowell, got, got to, thought, thought, you know, like throughout football, uh, admired this system, admired the football, and he tried to do a little uh, adaptation of it for City. Things weren't going great for City at the time. Certainly after the war, we'd struggled a little bit, to be honest with you. Uh, and as, as an admirer of the great, uh, the magnificent Maggies, uh, he sort of put his head together with his uh, with his main man, Don Revy at the time, who was playing to set about trying to emulate the system. I mean, that's where the name came from. It wasn't called the McDowell plan, was it? It was called the Revy plan. So they tried to instigate a similar similar system, not not identical, uh, to actually uh, with Manchester City and hopefully propel City into a bit more success than they've been been having over the last few seasons. So yeah, so that's how it starts. So Katrine Clay takes up takes up the story from there. Uh, Troutman in goal was key to the plan. Building up his now established style described as a fine mixture of power, accuracy, fearlessness and elegance. Bert was never a goal line keeper, preferring to go out aggressively to claim the ball and clear it, only ever standing on his line for a penalty. If a free kick or a corner was awarded to the other team, he positioned defenders on both poles to cover himself and once in possession of the ball, performed one of his legendary goal kicks or throws, which were so long they sent the ball well into the other half. If a forward barged him, which they could as long as both feet were on the ground, he'd go in sideways, meeting him with his shoulder. In the heat of the game, Troutman instinctively fell back on methods he learnt fighting the partisans in Russia. There you go, that's another story we'll have to tell. Countering. 
so hard it took the wind right out of them. Next time you barge me, I'll put you in hospital, you might threaten a player. And likely as not, they'd leave him alone for the next few games. With the Revy plan, Bert had to learn a new trick to add to his arsenal. Instead of kicking or throwing the ball out to a waiting player, he kicked it ahead of him. As he was already running up the field, by the time the other team could react, the ball had already been passed to one of City's strikers, who headed straight for goal. It required length and precision from Bert, but he knew just how to do that from all those early years playing Volker ball at home in Bremen, when he had often been the last man standing. It's like a type of dodgeball, this one that the, uh, obviously the... Uh, the uh, the part in Germany, the the younger uh, young Nazis etc. would uh, sort of was their sort of game of choice. Uh, he had often been the last man standing on his side, but still beat the opposition. Hitler Youth, that was it they were called, weren't they? Hitler Youth. Uh, catching the ball in his large hands and throwing it back with fearsome accuracy at one of the opposing team. So they were all out and he was the winner once again. At first the Revy plan didn't work very well. The reserves tried it out in early part of the season with mixed results and then the first division team used it against Preston North End and lost disastrously 5-0. The trouble was a new system needed time, changing tactics, playing more aggressively. It all needed practice with no guarantee as to the final outcome. The fans were up in arms, the journalists were sceptical, but Les McDowell, the board and the players were all behind it, knowing that something drastic was needed to stop the team slipping further down the league table. McDowell was the man in the firing line, but he stuck to his guns against all criticism, which Bert thought a fine thing. And the next big game against Sheffield United at Main Road was a different story. They won 5-2 and there was no stopping them after that. Uh, yeah, so there you go. Uh, so we'll go back to that in a moment. Um, yeah, with the Revy plan in place, City, after three years of struggling, as I said, the early 50s uh, in the first division, always in the bottom half, finally found themselves competing in the top half, yeah, due to these new tactics. But it was not the league, particularly, the way that it would actually uh, come to fruition, but the FA Cup, where uh, most success would come for this. On the way to a semi-final at Villa Park, this is the season 1954-55, uh, City beat Derby County, uh, United, Luton and Birmingham City and they only conceded one goal uh, and Burt was on top form throughout that cup run. They faced Sunderland in the semi-final on a rain-sodden Villa Park uh, pitch and on the only goal of the game came courtesy, yes, it came courtesy of this uh, Revy plan. So Catherine Clay takes up the story again as we look, look back to the book. Uh, but Don Revy raced down the pitch like Hungary's name there. Hijeku with his back to Bert who kicked the ball just ahead of him and Nobby Clark scored the winning goal with the well the only goal and winning goal with a great header after a brilliant cross from little Joe Hayes. The Revy plan had worked and against all the odds City were in the 1955 Cup final against Newcastle United at Wembley. Wembley, the very thought, sent shivers down Bert's spine. He'd been there five months earlier acting as interpreter in the England versus Germany game and had walked onto the pitch and into one of the goals just trying it out. Awed by the size of the stadium and all the tradition, never imagined he might be there himself one day. Now they had two weeks of training at Eastbourne, staying at the Queen's Hotel. Their every move reported in the national press. How they trained, what they ate, what they did for recreation, what they said, what they didn't. At the training ground, Troutman was always a star, lining up the players to take penalty kicks at him, one after another, entertaining the locals and coincidentally providing the press photographers with plenty of good pictures. One day, Bert had a bad fall which set off some fibro fibrositis and uh, rheumatism which had suffered on and off since Russia, obviously, in his, his war days, and the sport pages were full of it. Bert Troutman, Manchester City's world-class goalkeeper, was ordered to bed with fibrositis today, before City's shaken players had recovered from the news that left winger Roy Clark was unfit for the cup final on Saturday, reported Bob Pennington for the Daily Express from Eastbourne on the 4th of May, under the heading, Troutman, I can't go on, shock. Well, he went for a headline those days, clickbait. It wasn't called clickbait then, was it? But uh, they, they did uh, produce the headlines. Uh, he went on to write, 
Don Reb and his followers were peppering German-born Troutman with shots on Wembley quality turf at their practice ground Saffron's when Troutman grimaced with pain after holding a drive from Paddy Fagan. It's no good, he shouted. I can't go on. City players were silent as Troutman returned to the team's coach and sat there in pain from his stiffened neck and shoulder muscles. TV, cam TV cameraman pleaded, let Burke come back for a few more shots with the boys, but Burke was sent off to a local physiotherapist who put him right. Pennington went on tonight. He rejoined the team saying, I feel much better, so why didn't lead that with, why wasn't that the headline? Uh, Troutman, who has complained of rheumatic pains in his shoulders for several weeks, will rest tomorrow and have a workout on Thursday. The manager, Les McDowell, took the latest blow calmly. We are not worrying unduly. Heat treatment should clear this up in no time, said Revy. The boys felt a bit gloomy this morning. Our luck has been out with Johnny Hart, broken leg, and Roy Clark, injured knee, missing the final. But Bertie's so tough, I reckon he would play and play well, even if he were in a plaster cast. And sure enough, Bert recovered and soon joined in the training sessions again. In the afternoons, the team went for long runs along the cliffs. All the evenings were free, strictly supervised by Les McDowell and player Jimmy Meadows, uh, their self-appointed minder. Though even Jimmy couldn't find out who turned on the bathroom taps on the top floor one night, ruining all the ceilings in the rooms below. Let's go to the picture, someone said, because there wasn't much else to do in East born of an evening the choice was between two war films a cold it story with john mills and above us the waves with john mills again oh no said bert i'm fed up with your bloody war films and the way the germans are always the baddies if our officers had behaved as stupid as they do in your films they'd have been shot uh, jerry we won the war not you they'd have replied laughing and set off without him the morning of the Cup final, 7th of May 1955, turned out fine and sunny. The team had moved to the secret hideout at the Oaklands Hotel in Weybridge, appearing on the TV show the night before because Les McDowell knew the entertainment was all part of the game. There were hundreds of good luck telegrams and many of the players read their horoscopes over breakfast, hoping for good omens. They left the hotel by coach at one o'clock with a police escort. Crowds of people standing all along the route waving and shouting, good luck as Bert waved back. As the stadium, they had to fight their way through the crowds to the dressing room where each of them tried to relax in his own way. Bert's routine was always the same. He put his right boot on first and his shirt last. His football socks had to show the same number of rings and he had to be perfectly turned out. If it was a home game at Main Road, he was always pegged 32. And few people knew why, but without that link to home, he felt he couldn't go out and play his best. He loosened up for 20 minutes before kick-off and then he was ready. He didn't mind where he was in the in the lineup waiting to come out on the pitch. On this occasion, he was fourth next to Jackie Milburn, the Newcastle United forward. Aren't you cold, Bert? Shivering, up, shivering in the sun, I'll ask Jackie. You'll be OK once the game started, said Jackie, who'd been there before. It's this waiting that gets you. After that, it was out of the tunnel and onto the Wembley pitch to the deafening noise and abide with me sung by 100,000 voices. Well, I think it was 93,000 and something officially rising up to heaven. Bert Troutman, the first German ever to play in a cup final at Wembley, was how skipper Roy Paul, speaking into the microphone, introduced Bert to the stadium as the teams lined up on the pitch. Then the Duke of Edinburgh was introduced to the players one by one. Sehr gut, he said when he came to Bert, shaking his hand. And instinctively, Bert bowed in the German way, causing his astonished teammates amusement for years to come. In the end, City were the gallant and sporting losers, 3-1, and those Geordie fans were hoarse with cheering when Newcastle United went up to Royal Box to receive the cup and their medals from the Queen. But we did play with 10 men for two thirds of the game or three quarters of the game and uh, we still we're so there you go. anyway it's an excuse isn't it we, we, we won the year after uh, Bert was disappointed and annoyed with himself for letting in that last goal which he felt he could have stopped if he had been more alert though no one else agreed the times pointed to the devastating opening goal which left a black mark against Manchester defensive covering I think they scored in 43 seconds or something like that it showed clearly enough the importance of having played at Wembley previously before the City players had got used to the lush surface or acclimatised themselves to the atmosphere or to the distances White and Milburn swept down the right for Milburn to force a corner from Ewing. The report ended. The final memory was of the great goalkeeping of Troutman, the German for Manchester City, a man with the wrists of iron. Swooping on shots high and low like a predatory eagle, it was an exhibition of grace and power to remember. As far as Burt was concerned, he played at Wembley. That was the thing, and he believed Roy Paul when he stood, on, stood up on the coach on the way on the coach on the way to the post-match banquet at the Cafe Royal, uh, promising the lads in his inspirational way that they'd be back the following year.
Well, there you go. Of course, the disappointment uh, did drive City to, to replicate, as, as I'm recording this, the disappointment of a Champions League loss might, might uh, drive us to replicate that run and hopefully do better next year. But uh, this time it did again, as it did in the 30s, when we, we, we made the two trips to Wembley in the 1930s. Uh, and it, we did replicate that run the following season. And as we know, Bert would, uh, would go down in the annals of football folklore, not just City folklore, but football in general. And uh, obviously that 90 minutes on the pitch in that game uh, would uh, sort of go down in history, wouldn't it, for, for City and, and in football, football itself. So there you go. I just thought because there's not, there's not much said about the 1954-55 cup final. I think it was generally generally perceived. As I said, we we were quite unlucky. We lost Jimmy Meadows uh, quite early on, uh, so we did have to play with ten men. So even though we went at half time one one with ten men, obviously you're talking as you said the lush surface. You're talking sapping. It's very hard. And City, I'd say City were quite inexperienced at Wembley. Newcastle had played there before quite recently. That was a good cup team at the time. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of nerves with the city players that day, and probably probably what caused the defeat overall. Even even without having to play with ten men and Jimmy Meadows getting injured, we may have probably lost that. But uh, certainly Bert didn't didn't do any harm to his reputation. He had a fantastic game, even though you say he was he was a little bit disappointed. But uh, yeah, there's not never much said about that, I and mean, there's more obviously spoken about the fifty six cup final, isn't there? But uh, I just thought I'd share that with you. Just as a build up and a little thing about Bert, obviously on the on the way, and a little bit about the Revy plan. It's something I've touched upon on other other vlogs as well, so check those out. But I hope you enjoyed that. Let me know what you think. And anyway, if there's any any guys out there can remember. I mean, obviously we're talking the fifties, aren't we? Uh, so that you'd have to be of a grand old age. But uh, any 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 sort of memories yourself of Bert, etc. That'd be fantastic. Or anything you've been told by your, your parents or your grandparents and stuff like that and hope you enjoyed it no doubt we'll be revisiting this book in a future episode yeah even even to delve into his the hitler youth and his time in the army etc would be quite interesting i think from a point of view of, of looking at a city player and what um what his sort of life personal life was and stuff like that so as i say there's lots lots of books lots of stuff to get through but uh, i'm sure we'll be delving back into that Anyway, thanks a lot, Jim. What are you going to do the rest of the day? Have a great one. Look after yourselves, look after your friends, look after your families. More importantly, let's all look after each other. So we meet here again on the Citizen Channel. Or perhaps you have a flit across, have a look at my film and TV channel. I only ever ask one thing of you. Stay safe, Blues. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.